behalf of myself and my co-host Sean Burgess, the Storer Lecture Organizing Committee, the College of Biological Sciences, and the entire UC Davis community, it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and speaker, Nobel Laureate Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. Dr. Blackburn is presently Professor Emerita in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Black Blackburn is a true pioneer and leader in the field of chromosome biology, where she has made many seminal discoveries about the structure and maintenance of the ends of chromosomes, or telomeres, as well as the very special roles these structures play uh, in human biology. We are truly fortunate to have Dr. Blackburn visiting us for two lectures as part of the series, today for her public lecture, and again tomorrow for a more in-depth scientific presentation. I want to especially thank Liz for persevering to be here, not to be daunted either by a pandemic or a seriously sprained ankle. So welcome, Liz. <laughs> Just a, a few more brief introduction, introductory comments. I, I promise to be brief. Um, so Liz was born in Tasmania, Australia, where she first discovered her love of nature and science. She received her undergraduate education at the University of Melbourne and her PhD at the University of Cambridge. Following postdoctoral work at Yale, Liz saw the light and moved to California, where she established her own lab, first at UC Berkeley and then at UC San Francisco. While at Berkeley, Liz and her graduate student, Carol Greider, who many of you will know is a graduate of Davis High School, made pioneering discoveries about the replication of telomeres and discovered what they termed, termed telomerase, the enzyme that replicates these ends of chromosomes. One of the many fascinating aspects of telomerase was, was the discovery that it contains both RNA and protein. This remarkable discovery placed Liz firmly within the so-called RNA world at an exciting time in molecular biology following the discovery of self-splicing RNA introns and other functional RNAs. This is, I believe, where I first met Liz and her lab, as well as Sean, uh, through the Bay Area RNA Club uh, a few years ago. <laughs> I would also like to point out that her choice of organism for these early studies, the protozoan tetrahymena, with its fragmented genome containing thousands of telomeres, is a textbook example of the importance of choosing the right model system to address a biological problem. For the discovery of telomerase, Liz and Carol were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or, and Med or Medicine in 2009, which they shared with scientist Jack Shostak. This award is one of a very long list of honors that Liz has received over the years, including election to the National Academy of Sciences, as well as being named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. In more recent years, Liz has expanded her interest in the biology of telomeres to understand the relationship to a wide range of topics tied to human health, including stress and aging that we'll hear a little bit about today and more at tomorrow's lecture. As an indication of the popularity of this topic, her 2017 TED Talk on the relationship between telomeres, stress, and aging has over two million views. Finally, Liz has been an outspoken supporter of women in STEM and the role of scientists in bioethics. We are all very lucky, and I am grateful to have Liz with us today. Please help welcome me, uh, me welcoming Liz. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, so much. Uh, I have to better get rid of this large obstruction on my <laughs> screen here. Woo. What is it doing there? <laughs> System preferences, close window. <laughs> Can we get rid of that? Thank you. <laughs> we knew, we okay. knew the adventure wasn't quite over yet. <laughs> of course not. Okay. But heroic work done by the team here. And so I want to say thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me here. I've just been having a marvelous day talking science with so many scientists here and looking forward to even more tomorrow. And so um, I'm going to be talking about okay. a, oh, what's that? Almost there. Almost there. there. This just Oops, hit the wrong one, sorry. No, don't hit that one. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
So uh, a strange title, looking down the microscope to looking out the window, but it really does, um, I, I think, kind of capture my science journey, which I confess, you know, has been probably 50 years at least. And so just to tell you what we're going to do this afternoon, I always advise you on this because you can figure out which parts you want to sleep through. So first of all, a little bit of telomere basic science. Ted has already given you a good uh, hint to that. How telomere functions impact on human disease. Really, these are going to be overviews uh, because a lot, lot has been learned and so I can't delve into too much detail. But what I've become fascinated with in the last couple of decades has really been you know, the non-genetic influences on telomeres and there are some bad ones and there are some good ones. And fascinatingly, this kind of uh, study of these has, has been something that has really opened my eyes more to more looking out the window at the world around us because we can start to see implications which are, are now about things well outside our individual bodies or cells, and that is social, societal issues. And then at the very end, I want to really broaden the discussion more into thinking about science and its place in the world and how, how we do it. So that's, the, that's what we're going to talk about. And so my journey began, as uh, Ted alluded to, in the tiny microscopic organism which actually lives in pond scum and uh, basically uh, went, as uh, Ted had mentioned, looking for what was at the ends of the chromosomes in this very good experimental system to all the way to really looking out at a world full of, as we all know too well, challenges. Okay, basic science first of all. Quick primer here. So if you look uh, at not only the microscopic but molecular level of the um, inside the cell, that blue mass inside the cell is staining all the chromosomes. There are tens of thousands of these in this lucky little organism. And so it let us get a lot of DNA ends. And that in turn allowed me to look at what was at the very molecular nature of the ends of chromosomes. So those little red things at the end represent lots and lots of tiny repeated sequences, just a six nucleotide repeat sequence of the building blocks of DNA. And this makes up a terminal tract, a stretch of these tiny repeated sequences. Uh, and what they do is they attract a whole sheath of protective proteins around them. A lot is known about that from the work of a great many labs. And one of the things that, as I go through this talk, I just won't have time to name the tremendous number of contributors to this field and the number of people I've been able to collaborate with and have as co-workers have been too numerous. So I will be only referring to specific cases of a few people I've been so lucky to work with over the years. But be assured that this is a field with a lot of contributors from just many, many groups and research uh, settings all over the world. So we have this repeated sequence of DNA at the ends of chromosomes. So what? Um, it makes up the telomeres. They make what you might think of as a cap, protective cap. And Telomeres, though, have this propensity through a variety of natural processes that just are occurring in our cells all the time. And one particular kind is when cells keep replicating, they can't copy all their DNA out to the end. So they often shorten. And so there was this mystery that Carol Greider and I, as Ted alluded to when Carol was a student in my lab, we, we were addressing what, how can this telomere shortening be counted? And the answer was this um, enzyme which we discovered and they're called telomerase and that can elongate telomeres. So that sort of answered one particular question. Now, just to make it a bit more concrete, I thought it would be fun to just show you the kind of thing we did. We ground up tetrahymena cells and made an extract. And then we put in a short synthetic DNA, which is shown as this colored bar here, made up of the nucleotide building blocks, um, GGG, TT, GGG, TT, GGG, TT. That's the repeated sequence of DNA. That's the sequence at the ends of the chromosomes. And we made a synthetic version of that, ground up tetrahymena cells, put them into a test tube, and asked, could this be extended? Because we were looking for an activity that we could get our hands on that was making chromosomes longer, because we knew this had to happen one way or another. And so we just had to add you know, some magnesium ion and some building blocks of DNA, just DGTP and TTP as it turns out, for this thing to get extended with these added nucleotides. So I'm showing Carol and I way back, <laughs> and pictures taken way back then. 
what was fun was it also added a lot of repeats. I mean, this is really good at adding these repeats. Let me show you what this looks like when you visualize these DNA products being added in a reaction in the test tube in a, uh, a separation experiment where, so we have a test tube and we put the contents onto what's called a DNA gel, which um, is a, allows the fragments to migrate through an electric field. And the smaller they are, so starting with the input oligo, the longer they run from top to bottom, and then the bigger they are, the higher they'll run. So each one of these groups is a time course. And what you can see is that these, these fragments are getting longer and longer and longer with time. So this, and this is one by Margaret Lee, one of my students back in the 90s, who ran this very pretty example of what, what Carol and I had discovered you know, a couple of years before that, a few years before that. So basically, there we have this reaction. And as Ted alluded to, there was a really unexpected aspect of this. And this was that this enzyme was not just made of proteins, uh, and that's that kind of aqua-colored blob, uh, but it was also containing an RNA component. And that RNA component was being used as a template to correctly add the right nucleotide building blocks onto the ends of the DNA, which is shown as that double-stranded helix. And then there's an extension of one strand of that helix. And that sits in the template region in the active site and gets extended. And it can add these repeats over and over and over again. So that was the basis. That, there's the basics there. Now, what happens in uh, so protein, RNA, many other components, and many labs have found many components that regulate this. So now we've got the idea, but what about in humans? Well, we have the same mechanism going on, but humans keep their telomerase very regulated. And in some cells, it's under very, very, it's kept on a very short leash, a very tight brain. And it's under all sorts of controls. So it doesn't just freely add those you know, dozens and dozens of repeats. It's controlled in all sorts of molecular ways. So it's a fertile field for molecular biologists and cell biologists to study all these mechanisms. And I've listed them, and they're very technical sorts of terms. But the point is, at almost every kind of molecular mechanism you can think of, telomerase action on telomeres will be regulated by them. So, so what are we to do with this enormous complexity here? How are, we, how are we to figure out what's going on? So we can look at, well, what's the net result of all of this? And the net result is that during the you know, many decades of our lives, telomeres do, on average, in many, many cell types, gradually get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's fairly coordinated between many different cell types, although there's certainly spec you know, high specificities for some cell types. But basically, there's a lot of general shortening as we go through aging. So now we have two things going on. We have, as I said, there are natural processes in cells in which telomeres are naturally shortening. And that's counted by an enzyme that we know does exist in human cells, although it's under very tight controls of variety of kinds, so they can elongate. So the bottom line, though, is that in humans, many cell types have rather limiting amounts of telomerase. It's kept under tight controls. And so sometimes telomeres get too short to make that protective sheath of proteins around them work. And that has real consequences. So what happens is that when telomeres in cells get too short, and the many, many research groups have really consolidated this picture. The telomeres think that they're a break in the chromosome. Cells do not like breaks in chromosomes. They say, I've got to repair this break. So they send signals. It's called the DNA damage response. And it sends signals to the cells. Long story short, that sets up a lot of things that are basically not very good for cells. First of all, the telomeres get too short, so the cells stop dividing. And the cells go into a state called senescence. Not only does it not allow cells to keep multiplying, and that's important if you're a cell that should be, say, replenishing blood cells or replenishing the lining of your intestine or your hair follicles or your skin follicles. So the cells go into this senescent state. But they also, as well as having their cell renewal capability stopped, they also have altered cellular functions. 
depends on the cell, but an important kind is that those signals send signals to the energy powerhouses within the cells called mitochondria, and they start malfunctioning. Now, the other bad news is that if other things start going wrong in the cells, and again, are especially important leading to cancer cells, the telomeres will now start trying to stick to each other and fuse chromosomes, and this can lead to chromosome instability. So you see at the cellular level, a lot of basic science has said this is not good to have uh, telomeres becoming too short. And yet humans do have apparently an, an insufficiency of telomerase because there is general shortening. So how is this important in humans? Okay, so I've said telomeres, um, when they don't function protectively properly, they send this damage to cells and it limits cell renewal capability and leads to genomic instability in some cells. And in fact, this shortening is, is the most common way to make dysfunction. Tomorrow, in a more detailed lecture, I'll talk about some experimental ways that we can explore and have explored to ex look at this. But this is the most natural one that's happening, the shortening. So what's the consequence of that? Uh, so I've talked about the bad news for the cells themselves. But actually, it's worse. So you, in an organism, you can actually get a vicious cycle set up. So here we have telomere shortening. And I'm just going to illustrate this in a very schematic way. But basically, the telomere shortening, as I said, you know, if telomeres get critically short so that they're now sending signals to cells, and I just told, said we get cell malfunction, we get cell senescence. Those then, for example, a tissue that needs to keep replenishing can't be, so this will contribute to, to, contribute to disease tissues. Okay, now, Part of the cell malfunction discovered by Judy Campisi some years ago is that they actually start sending pro-inflammatory signals outside the cells and around the body. So inflammation starts going up. That sets up an environment with other proteins sending signals, with um, more reactive oxygen species and that sort of oxidative stress, which chemically can further shorten the telomeres. And so you get this cycle where it gets worse and worse, right? Uh, so you set the cycle up and it can start to reinforce itself. And of course, we know inflammation itself is having other adverse effects on tissues. So you see the schematic, you know, telomere shortening can set things up that have sort of reverberating long-term effects. So. Many, many studies uh, look at telomere length and say, how is this process going in various humans in various situations? Now, the heroine of my research group, uh, Jolin, uh, who really uh, leads these days and has for many years these telomere collaborative studies, is uh, this is Jolin. And basically, I won't go into the technicalities. They're well worked out. We can get reliable telomere measures. Many, many labs do it in different ways. And you can measure how long telomeres are. So when you can measure things, that's good. You can start doing analyses and trying to understand how telomere shortening can have impacts. So the general observation, I've shown it in a different way, is if we look at telomere length, and that's the vertical y-axis, uh, longer on the top, shorter on the bottom, and we looked at through many, many decades of a human lifespan, this is roughly what you'd see, this kind of general decline, actually kind of faster in the earlier stages, but continuing through, through a lot of life. So that's the general schematic. Now, what about the reality of the real data? Okay, now there's the real data. So this is just a typical study done many, you know, some years ago, and it's the same thing where you're looking at each, each circle represents a snapshot of the DNA length on the y-axis, the vertical axis, as a function of the age of the person on the horizontal axis. axis. So this is, you know, hundreds of samples. So two things are going to be immediately, oh, and there's a lot of, you know, we can adjust for various variables uh, and, you know, adjust for sex and, you know, because there's differences between sexes, you can adjust for the assay. You know, you do a lot of careful controls, so you, you really believe this is a good reflection of the average telomere cells, in this case in white blood cells, which are a good immune uh, cell, cell sampling of something you can easily get, a blood sample, 
kind of gives you a window into your body and your immune system. Okay, so these are telomere lengths, and you can see right away, first of all, yeah, there's a general decline with age, but it's only accounting for about 10% or less of the variability. So why, for anybody of a fixed age, is there so much variation in telomere length? Why? And does it matter? What's the significance? So that's what I want to just take you through now and talk about how this kind of, the science of understanding telomeres in cells, measuring telomeres in people, how it's related to this aspect of humans, and that is um, aging through the many decades of human life. Many facets, of course, are important in aging, but the one that this science has turned out to really relate to is increased susceptibility to the diseases that become more and more common as we get older. And so we can depict now in a different kind of way um, how, how we think about health, right? So let's on this vertical axis say the higher on the axis they are, the better is your health index, your, your overall well-being by whatever criterion you want. And on the y axis, the x-axis going across is your, the age, the number of years. So uh, in this person, they would have what we'd call a short health span. So the yellow is good, they have no sort of high, um, you know, they don't have diseases which would now um, impair their well-being or their functionality or just, you know, have diseases of aging and we'll go through what they are. And so we'd say this person has um, a fairly short health span, right? So uh, what if a different person? They won't live all that much longer, but during their life they would spend much longer time in their health span, right? So when we think about, you know, aging and aging well, We'd kind of like to go from one curve to the other. That would be the goal. Uh, you know, here's some 100-year-olds and, you know, healthy, lively, over 100 years old. You know, that's the kind of thing we, we would aspire to. So the question is, how can one improve health span and, uh, that is to say, well-being through, through life? Not necessarily to live for huge numbers of years over, you know, the common human lifespan of what is 120 years about the maximum known, but how can it be lived in a way with good well-being and good functionality? And that's where telomere science turns out to be playing into that aspect of ageing. So a great many studies, again from many groups around the world, have given us this generalization. The shorter the telomeres are, if you look at large groups of people where you can do reliable statistical analyses, the more likely people are to have a future onset of diseases of aging and mortality. Okay, So there's a relationship between telomere shortness and all of these diseases statistical likelihood of occurring in the future. After you measure the telomere length, you wait, you say, how likely are people to get this? Similarly, the degree of telomere shortness is statistically predicting actually mortality rate as well in people. Okay, but now notice this arrow has two directions. You don't know which caused which, right? It doesn't really tell you. This is where genetics has been so informative and the molecular biology of understanding what goes on with genes which, when they're changed, change telomere maintenance. And I'm going to just collapse a lot of studies into some very simple schematic view of this very important thing that in humans and in other organisms, genetics tells us causality. Because if a gene that does something known changes and we see a change, it's very hard to escape the conclusion that the gene is having this phenotypic effect. It's causing something. And so what we found is, uh, not we, many people have found that even in the general population, there are genes for well-known telomere and telomerase enco encoding the components of these and variants of them that make telomeres shorter and there's good genetic reasons to say they are making the telomeres shorter, they are associated with higher risks of cardiovascular, certain dementias, particularly Alzheimer's, uh, diabetes, and even certain lung diseases. So this causality of at least some of this relationship. And so that's saying, okay, well, this telomere shortening is not just a sort of incidental going on as we get these kinds of um, common, common diseases of 
aging, many of which are accounting for mortality in, in the aged, in our populations, but there's at least some contributory role. They're actually playing a role upstream. Okay. Now, I mentioned cancers there, uh, or in that list of diseases, but I didn't mention them anymore um, because it's actually it's more complex, and I want to spend a moment just kind of giving you the big overall picture that's emerged. Okay, so you know that there are new, I don't know, dozens and dozens of different kinds of human cancers. And accordingly, the relationship of telomere maintenance is, is not the same for all cancers. Now, again, genetics has been very informative here. Now, uh, first of all, I want to point out that um, as cells progress into cancer, they actually, for a fully blown cancer, they turn on their telomerase very high. But that doesn't always happen early in the stages of um, cancer. But cancer cells can find ways to turn telomerase on very high. But what we want to know is what is the risk of getting cancer, because this kind of process is very, very common, this upregulation in the later development of cancer cells. But what's the chance of somebody having a cancers based on how their telomeres are being maintained? The, this is where genetics has helped us a lot. So there are people who have mutations. Luckily, they're rare, but they have just um, only half the amount of telomerase that, they normally, that you normally would have. These are just simple mutations. And you can see very clearly the telomeres get extremely short, and they lead to the, you get chromosome instability. These telomeres can't protect the ends. They start sticking together. That can promote cancers. Immune surveillance is also down because the immune cells are losing their telomeres and they can't keep replenishing to control cancers, as we now know the immune system is important for doing. And so these kinds of categories of cancers uh, include some of the blood cancers, certain squamous cells, certain gastrointestinal cancers. Now, even people who don't have rare mutations but who have um, mutations or just changes in the genes that are important for telomere length maintenance just in the population that has been shown to um, increase chances of pancreatic cancer. Okay. So we'd say, okay, well, we really need to maintain long telomeres and you know, don't even think about having shorter ones. But <laughs> some cancers, and again, genetics told us this, some cancers actually that just nudge up the level of telomerase and not that much, they get... Um, uh, they, they are caused by this genetic change. It nudges up telomerase, which basically gives the cancer cells more time to turn into cancer cells and then fully develop. And this is a whole other different set of cancers. So now, you know, what are we going to do? Because we're sort of on this knife edge, right? I mean, not good, right? Now, this is genetically determined telomeres. I'm going to show you and talk to you about how there are other things besides genes that affect telomere maintenance. And the very interesting thing is that if you step back and you look at all of the causes of mortality in a population, this is a study that was done in uh, the Scandinavian countries, it's the Copenhagen study, 64,000 people. And what they did was they said, well, if somebody's telomeres are measured, and you can put them into different bins from the shortest all the way, divide them into tenths, down to the longest. So the shortest are on the, uh, on the right and the longest are on the left. And then they said, let's wait about seven years and see who dies. And that's the top curve. And what you can see is that you're about three times as likely to die if you had the shortest versus the longest telomeres, right? And you can see that quite, you know, graded distribution. And then you can say, well... They know because they have good you know, records, well, what people primarily died of. And you can see all of these different curves uh, uh, for the different causes. They're all sort of showing the same thing. Uh, cardiovascular, uh, and particularly uh, the major ones, cardiovascular, and also um, cancers. Cancers are the blue diamonds. So you see the same gradual increase. So overall, if you measure telomere length, Remember, I was talking about the genetic determinants of telomere length, but now if you actually measure the telomere length, overall, if you just add up all cancers together, it's still better to have longer versus shorter telomeres. 
This is a very overall picture. Of course, there's going to be modified by different people's genetic backgrounds and things, but this is sort of a useful overall picture, I think, to keep in mind. So basically, uh, we'd like to know how our telomeres are being maintained and can we do something about it? And so I'm going to show this uh, result of this study, which is a collaborative study we did with um, people at the VA, um, at the University of California um, v, uh, and in San Francisco, and the VA in San Francisco, and these were outpatients, and they had what's called stable coronary heart disease, so they weren't that healthy, they were middle-aged. And we followed them for five years, and so we measured telomere length, and at the beginning there was some length, and then at the end there was some length, and there was a whole graded series of how people's telomere length changed with, um, hmm. <laughs> ah, changed over that five year. Some people's telomeres, those are the ones on the, uh, the, the left here, some people's telomeres got longer. And then going all the way through to not much change to some people's telomeres got shorter. More people's telomeres got shorter than longer. But then we said, if you look within each of the group, what after now, in the next four years, who had died? And it was quite striking that there was quite a relationship. Again, so the rate at which your telomeres changed, up or down, in the previous five years, then determined who would die in the next four years. And now these are fairly big numbers. So this is starting to get us more toward sort of real clinical realities here because, uh, you know, approaching a 50% rate of dying is, is pretty important clinically. So this was going up in, the, again, in this sort of graded way. So telomeres are being dynamic through life. They're not just inevitably falling down as those single snapshot curves that I was showing you were um, indicating. Okay. So what we'd like to do then is to uh, improve the prediction of what we can say when you look at telomeres. So I've given you these statistical things, but if you're a patient or a doctor, you're not going to be that impressed by them, right? It's just that when you look statistically, you see these clear relationships, but they're not really very actionable. And so I thought it was very interesting. This a very beautiful study was done at MD Anderson a few years ago, and I just want to show you their results schematically. They had bladder cancers patients, and they did two things at the time of diagnosis. They measured their depression on a multi-point scale and then divided them up into um, just in the middle of the scale, high depression versus low depression. They also measured their blood cell telomeres in a blood draw, right? And then they said, what happened? Now, both of them contributed a bit so if they had shorter telomeres or more depression, yeah, there was some effect on bladder cancer mortality. But the people who had both depression and both the shorter telomeres had a synergistically higher rate of mortality. So I think this is a really interesting finding because we hope we can generalize from this and say, well, maybe if you add telomere shortness to all these other things that are going on, you might be able to increase the prediction power that you have. Now, I've shown this for one other biomarker, but you could imagine adding a lot of biomarkers. And we know we're complex interacting sort of systems in our organism. We know, you know, interactions are very, very important uh, and often hard to parse out. And you just have to measure them and see what happens. So now I hope I can show that, you know, we should be interested in what's happening to our telomeres. Um, given that we can't choose our parents and choose our genetics, okay, well, is there something else we can do? Are there non-genetic influences on telomeres? And basically, there, there are. Um, there's a lot of studies, but I think the key point is that a lot of influences that you can measure, again, in large groups of people, are what you might call um, dose-dependent. A really good example comes from this big study where we collaborated with researchers at Kaiser Permanente, um, and they had a lot of data on um, patients, and uh, including who had a history of cigarette smoking, you know, numbers of packs, numbers of years. And when we looked at the telomere length, you can see that there was just this graded uh, in shortening, shortening, shortening of people when you just measured telomeres and compared it with their history, the pack years of cigarette smoking. 
So this really sort of typifies this dose dependency, if you will, of shortening and um, uh, some other factor. So another thing which is very prominent, uh, and we really have to think of this, is, is stress. Okay. So this was where um, we, we got thinking about an idea that I shouldn't say is a new idea. So, so let me tell you a story from 2,500 years ago. Uh, so this was a famous uh, military general, and he was uh, trying to escape from one part of China to another, crossing a very dangerous border pursued by his enemies. And so he knew one night he had to get across this border safely, <clears throat> and uh, he knew his life was in tremendous danger. And so the story goes that um, you know, practically overnight, his hair turned white, his features aged enormously. Okay. The, the good news for him was that it so changed his appearance that he got across safely because nobody recognized him. But the point being that chronic and real psychological stress has long been understood to be something that increases something about people's aging. So several years ago, my colleague Alyssa Eppel at UCSF asked a question of us, and she said, do we know if severe chronic psychological stress affects telomere maintenance? And Jolene in my lab led our part of these studies, and we still continue in various collaborative studies still. But it was a really interesting question because nobody had actually asked it. And so Alyssa and her colleagues had a group of people who were under very severe stress for a long time, and they were mothers of a child their child who had a long-term chronic illness of some kind or another. And then there were control mothers, and you knew the number of years they'd been under this um, very stressful situation because the mother in these situations was the primary caregiver, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of inability to cope, a lot of things. So here was the simple result that just struck us so much, which was not only was telomerase lower in those people who had higher stress as measured by a set of psychological profiles, but their telomeres were shorter in that high stress group compared with the low stress people. So this was a very interesting result, number one. It was also very interesting because the shorter the telomeres were, the longer the caregiver mothers had been under stress. So this was looking like this influence was coming from the outside. Now, what do you do when you get this kind of result? Well, it has to be reproduced, right? It has to be replicated. Is it just a freak of a, you know, statistics in those days? Uh, you know, this was only the only study that had been done. And fast forward to many years of multiple groups uh, research, and basically it's now pretty clear that chronic psychological stress, which has been well documented, by the way, to have impacts on making it more likely people will have, for example, cardiovascular disease is one good example, but this is being related, we can see, quantifiably related to shorter telomeres. I've just told you how those impact on more likelihood of getting disease. And you get this whole fascinating dose uh, and dependency. The worse whatever the stress is or the longer its duration, the relatively shorter the telomeres are in these control group studies. So now there's a big collection of what uh, the sort of main categories that have been well documented in multiple studies to have effects on telomeres. So let's look at the ones that are related to making telomeres more likely to be short. There's a whole list of them, and uh, you know they include chronic stress of a variety of kinds. I told you about caregiver stress. We also quickly found that this related to the stress of caregivers of a family who had uh, a family member with a dementia, uh, severity and longevity of depression. Uh, prenatal stress we see has effects on telomeres in the newborns. Childhood traumas, including abuse, and abuse of adults in domestic situations, all quantifiably related to telomeres being extra short compared with control groups. And then things that are coming more from the outside, like the deprivation index of, an, of a neighborhood, you know, what the social and economic and physical conditions of a neighborhood are like, pollution, particularly exposures to different kinds of pesticides, uh, tobacco use. I showed you that example of that sort of dose dependency. Um, poorer diets, Mediterranean diets associated with better telomeres. And you can correct for a lot of 
co-varying kinds of things and show that these are factors that's not explained away by something else. So it's not all gloom and doom because there are a bunch of things which actually do correlate with having better telomere maintenance. Um, and so we can put them into a sort of group called resiliency factors. And happily, they include exercise, which we have all known as good for us and you know, good sleep patterns. Interventions such as interventions uh, doing stress reduction um, and the various kinds, but mindfulness, uh, intense mindfulness ones. Our colleague Cliff Saron has been playing, our colleague, your colleague at the UC Davis has been playing a big role in those. Certain kinds of clear, um, random, randomized, you know, controlled studies uh, where you do interventions have shown certain exercise really is improving telomere maintenance and omega-3 in the diet has shown nice results. And there are interactions. The effect of exercise on telomere maintenance was actually more dramatic in chronically stressed individuals than it was in non-stressed individuals, for example. So we've learned a lot, you know, we got tips for the tips of your chromosomes, right? But there's actually um, some really serious sorts of considerations that came from this list on the left that I'm showing here. The ones that are associated with shortening of telomeres over and above what you would see if you didn't have these factors. And what's, I just want you to read this list for a moment here. Okay. And look at that list in the light of, well, when we think about societal um, factors around us, implications of policy of different kinds, we can see a lot of these would be affected by those. Prenatal stress, you know, making sure mothers are well taken care of during pregnancy. Low education, you know, not finishing high school was clearly associated over and over with shorter telomeres all the way into middle age and elderly people. And this was after you correct for all sorts of factors like income and jobs and, uh, you know, housing and all these sorts of things. So, so basically, this started really taking me out of my thinking about just the lab and the individual sort of person in terms of their health and their disease and really started me thinking, gosh, we can see these quantifiable effects on telomere shortening with things which are clearly being determined a lot by big societal um, factors and how policies go, what they are. So it really got me um, you know, thinking about we can quantify this. And so perhaps you know, it's, it's important to see that this kind of very objective measure where we just measure the telomere lengths in people, we don't know who telomeres we're measuring, it's very objective, and you can see all these relationships. So this is a sort of objective way of looking at, um, you know, well, what sorts of effects in a societal way, in a population way, do some of our policies have? I think I've been struck by that. So to that end, what, what we're doing right now is at, at my lab at, at UCSF, we basically just have a small team and the leaders are uh, Jolin, who I introduced you to before, and uh, Dana Smith, and they have a small team of people. And we just help our colleagues in lots of collaborative studies to look at measures of telomere maintenance, usually telomere length, but sometimes other ones, in various studies which relate, you know, all the way from human aging and diseases, risk factors, and so forth. And this has been uh, just immensely interesting because there are so many fascinating studies where our collaborators are asking, you know, what I think are important questions for human well-being. Um, and uh, we want to see if telomeres can help to um, address this. I'm going to just visualize this, uh, why we would add telomere length measures to this point that I made before, which is if you combine telomere length measures with other biomarkers, you can see a more dramatic effect. Now, I told you about the bladder cancer patients, but I want to now show you this same finding in a sort of more dramatic way. So basically, this is the scientific view of it. And what they were asking of the bladder cancer patients 
after you adjusted for all the things that might affect their mortality, like their age, their gender, their ethnicity, their smoking status, the stage of cancer, the grade of the cancer, what the treatment was, you could correct for all of those, and you could get what are called technically Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Uh, that's just for the aficionados among you. But what I want to show you is that kind of the findings, but in a more visual way. So you divide people up in this, they had over 400 patients, and you could divide them up into those who had longer telomeres and were less depressed, or shorter telomeres and were more depressed, or just one or the other, right? So here were the, each of these groups of people, and you could say, well, what was the outcome? What was the proportion after two and a half years of people in each of those group who had died to start with? So the fraction of people who had died in the long telomere less depressed group was this. Uh, not much change, a bit of a change, but the shorter telomere group, yeah, a bit of a change in the more depressed, but really much more in the combination, just those two simple measures. And then after five years, which is a really important landmark in cancer treatment and outcome, this was the, whoops, <laughs> this was the result. So, you know, they had all, so combining telomere measures can start to be useful. So to that end, in our studies, we've been doing studies where the telomere measure can be combined with all sorts of things that our collaborators are interested in. And because I'm at UC Davis, I just want to highlight the uh, collaborative study with Cliff Saron and his group of people where we're looking at longitudinal uh, changes in telomeres during the pandemic, a time of great stress, and all the sorts of factors that could be um, affecting both that and where we could see um, measures like with telomeres of how interventions such as meditation practices could be helping this. Uh... We're doing another study. Um, well, we're looking at a lot of things where we're looking at things like um, you know, racial and ethnic behavioral determinants of ovarian cancer. It's not just the same. How does that relate to cardiovascular disease risk? We can measure telomeres as part of that. Social disadvantage and fetal programming, very important for the next generation. Uh, certain other communication uh, studies to ask, you know, how can we be better at testing for, um, or having acceptance for testing for antibody uh, uh, prevalence, you know, in SARS-CoV-2, for example. But I just want to highlight the BOOST study as an interesting example, because in this study, you know, it's always mysterious about um, COVID. Some people get it badly, some people get it not so badly. Age, we know, is a tremendous dependent, and there's a lot of biological uh, aspects of the immune system people are understanding are depend are affecting how well someone will be able to respond to the infection and get or not to get the disease, and what about how well they are protected by vaccines? You know, we're well protected, but we know that there's a decline after a certain time. So this big st NIH study, um, and Alyssa Apple is one of the co-PIs, co uh, is to ask about a whole lot of other things that might be affecting the response to vaccines, not only age or immune cells, but a lot of other factors in their lives, sleep and mood and stress-related, a lot of things like that that haven't been accounted for in terms of why is there such variation in you know, who gets severe COVID and who, in particular, after vaccination, who then succumbs to having less protection and faster. So that's just an example. Um, and, you know, we want to understand, maybe there are some useful predictions. So what would we do this? Maybe in the future, perhaps this, this pandemic, perhaps in others, it might be useful to know who's going to be at high risk, who are we going to have to really make sure we boost up, you know, and make sure that they are boosted quickly because we know they will be more likely to be losing uh, protection from vaccination. You know, maybe we could see factors that could be intervened that perhaps you know, we could increase people's uh, level of protection. So these are all ongoing. We don't know any answers, but it's really kind of been interesting to see, well, how can we help in these studies by providing this kind of objective measure? And I don't have any answers for that yet. So I've basically been talking about science and talking about, you know, a lot of it's sort of clinical science, if you will, including the psychological and, uh, you know, the broader aspect of clinical, the whole person, 
But now I want to go to the last part of the last couple of minutes into something that really this sort of led me, led me into all of these implications of, of this research that I've been talking about. And, and that was to um, start working with a lot of young scientists. So every year, for about the last 70 years, um, a few dozen Nobel laureates annually come together with several hundred young scientists from all over the world at a place called Lindau, in, it's in Europe. And for a whole week, we just spend this week immersed sharing and talking about and discussing science. And out of one of the more recent meetings, it was luckily before the pandemic, we started realizing that there's a really interesting aspect of science which relates to the trust aspect of science in society at large, which is, you know, how, how do we do science? And so um, if you step back and you think of clinical people, they take, you know, a Hippocratic oath, right? So um, we've talked about the science of telomeres, how it can inform uh, current societal issues. What about how we do science? Now, we know that this is really important. Uh, we just listed the just, you know, a subset, but a major subset of the tough challenges human, humanity faces from climate change and loss of biodiversity through violence and wars and, you know, inequal, uh, unequal access to resources and to health and pandemics, obviously. You know, we have a challenging world, right? Science, we know, is part of the answer. Not the only, but it is certainly an important part. So could we, as scientists, help our contribution to trying to deal with these challenges by sort of showing that science could be something to be trusted? And I think of clinicians uh, and health, you know, people in the health, um, health, health givers, right? Health what's the word, healthcare, right? They have a Hippocratic Oath, but we don't really have one in science. Now, in science, we sort of teach each other. It's all sort of implicit what we do as scientists. And so we realize that we need to look inside our profession and think about, you know, can we do science better? And not just for the scientists, but for everybody in, in this troubled planet of ours. And this is, a, this is a work in progress. I love this quote from a, a New York artist. The road to progress is always under construction. But let me tell you where, where we've got. So as a result of these discussions, we came up with something that we call you know, the Lindau Guidelines, and it's for scientists. But the idea is to give people who are in science a guideline, but also if you knew what these guidelines were, the outside world would sort of see a demystification somewhat of science and say these are the things that in our profession are important. And as I said, we you know, develop these things at these Lindau uh, Nobel laureates meetings. They're called the Nobel laureates meetings, but they have hundreds of young scientists from all around the world, and they had a lot of input into this. Now, we're still, there's, there's a website listed in the bottom just called Lindau Guidelines, easy to find. We're working on this, but we've sort of consolidated into a list of things, which are guidelines, which are kind of practical guidelines. Um, you know, I, I can elaborate them a little further, but essentially, you know, the obvious one will is adopt an ethical code. You know, be honest and rigorous in your science and make sure that you uh, present it, uh, you know, uh, truthfully and that you um, uh, respect your co-workers. But then there were some much more specific aspects like, you know, publish results and share your results, open access. Make sure that you share your data and your code. Uh, you know, obviously work truthfully and transparently. Reward systems, you know, we don't uh, reward collaboration as much as we should. Change of those. Support talent everywhere, no matter where it comes from or who is providing the talent, because we've had a very lopsided kind of development of science in the last couple of centuries. Uh, make sure we're communicating it to society and try to educate, you know, as much as we can. So that's the kind of thing that I think is one little answer to how can we help science to solve all of these big problems that the world presents us with. And so with that... I will just leave you with the thought that, uh, you know, to regress our most critical issues that we are sharing on this planet, well, we must do not only trustworthy science, but science that people can see our profession does in a trustworthy way. It has to be inclusive to make it really 
the science that is most valuable, and we need to be collaborative because we need to be thinking uh, not just of our own little sort of local spheres, but we need to be thinking of everybody and, of course, uh, the planet. And so I'm going to leave you with that thought at this moment, and uh, thank you very much for being here and being so patient at the beginning. Thank you. that I, I, I enjoyed doing science. So when I was really in the flow of doing it, I, I would be working hard. But I really liked to go and do things and have fun as well. And I think you need to have that mixture uh, and sort of work hard, play hard. Was that the answer to your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think do both. You know, do do the things that you love to do. Don't just go outside for, you know, going outside. There's probably some reason you either enjoy it or you feel it has a purpose. And so I think that just being, you know, constantly not refreshing your mind and your soul with doing other things, it won't be good for your science in the long run because science has a lot of creativity to it as well as work. You need to keep that brain and spirit <laughs> going well. So you shouldn't feel criticized if you're working too hard because you can do that for a while, but stop and give yourself um, some really enjoyable time because it honestly helps the science. So if anybody tells you, you know, you're not working hard enough, well then you can say, it's helping me to <laughs> do other things. And I think we often have misconceptions about, oh, you know, can somebody be a mother and do science? Some of the best scientists I know, there are lots of scientists I know who've had young children who can do both science very well and be, you know, parents very, very well. So a lot of preconceptions about how science should be done, I think, bear, bear examining. Great question. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so, so obviously telomeres are incredibly powerful biomarker. But I wonder in the context of the, sort of the broader audience and a lot of students, how many things are we missing that might be also powerful biomarkers oh, that, that don't yes. show up in your telomere? Oh, yes. Sort of I'm just telling you one way we can add to all of the other things. We know that there are lots of risk factors for diseases. The quantifiable effects of telomeres, they're not necessarily all that huge for the population. But as I showed you, I gave you one example for the bladder cancer. When you combine them with somebody else, in this case it was fascinating, it was depression, you see bigger effects. They're intertwined, intertwined a lot of these biomarkers. So telomeres kind of, because of this ability to set up the signaling pathways, they can play into a number of other processes that go on, whether it's you know mitochondria not functioning as we get older and uh, you know our muscles getting frailer. In a big study we collaborated with, uh, people looked at how frail somebody was and how likely, these are old people, how likely they were to die or die of cardiovascular disease, and it was predicting. But if you said if they had shorter telomeres, then they became a lot more likely to die. Um, there are you know, molecular markers of mitochondria which, if you combine them with telomere length, become better predictors. So we know, um, and, and I'm going to emphasize this more tomorrow, that telomeres shortening is taking a place within a big complex system of other things going on. So that means you have to come to my lecture tomorrow so I can tell you about, at least to the first half tomorrow, where I'm just going to try and put that into the context of the many things that go on as, as we age. So, so thank you for you know, reminding us that the perspective is it's a factor, but it's a quantifiable one, and it's one that we actually understand fairly well in humans. So you know, other, other aspects of aging, of course, do go on, yeah. 
Alex over here. Um, thank you for a great talk. Um, I have kind of a technical question. So obviously, uh, measuring telomere lengths in white blood cells is yes. probably the easiest way to do it. But because of yes. the behavior of those cells, you know, clonal expansion, that maybe there's a lot more variability than... Absolutely, yes. So would something like buccal cells work? Can you get okay. enough of them to yep. measure? Um, I'll answer the second. So for the Kaiser study, we actually did um, saliva, which is a mixture of, you know, epithelial cells plus leukocytes, and saw, because the numbers were large enough that we could extract statistical trends and so on, uh, you can use buccal cells, which will have a... Okay. The bottom line is that measures of telomeres in various purified cell types taken straight from people tell us two things. If you look between different cell types, then they're actually fairly well correlated within one individual. So if you're a person with short white blood cell telomeres, you'll have actually short, uh, shorter, you know, skin fibroblast telomeres. And if you have longer, it'll be longer for both. Now, within that, as you said, a lot of history goes on in cells. If we look at just total peripheral blood mononuclear cells, forgive us, we're going to get slightly technical here, but this is just what you see and can quickly purify a subfraction of white cells called peripheral blood mononucleosides. It's got a mixture of cells. And you compare that with granulocytes, another white blood cell type that comes out and doesn't have a very long lifespan, but you can measure telomeres in it. They correlate really well across, you know, within individuals. And then if you look at CD4, T cells, they have had a recent lineage history with CD8, 28 positive ones. They correlate really tightly within an individual and they change together. B cells tend to have longer telomeres and exhausted and terminally differentiated, sort of reaching the end of their useful lifetime CD8, CD28 negative cells, they actually have longer telomeres. So there's a lot of information there. And the big thing is money and time. So, so measuring from blood samples is cheap and easy and sort of democratic. You can do it, and if you can do it right, you get this information because you know it reflects a lot of this detail in the other cell types. But you can probe deeper if you, deeper if you have enough budget. It, it, it isn't wildly more variable than, um, than a different cell type. That's the important thing. Well, well that's the thing. We, and we know muscle cells are different, you know. So there are differences, but... It's really a matter of what can you find out in a practical, real way, because in the research world, there's tons of beautiful work probing into the maintenance of telomeres and different immune cells and as they go through their lineages and how this relates to detailed disease processes. And there's fascinating things that are going on that relate partly to the fact that when telomeres get too short in these immune cells, they stop being able to, A, function normally and B, um, proliferate. So I've given you this sort of, um, you know, this sort of distilled view, but there's much, much more that has gone on, and mini labs, including ours, has probed into this because we sort of worried, oh, if we see a change, is it just because some fractions of cells just came into the bloodstream? Nothing to do with telomere change. So we really had to do a lot of controls to get some sense of what it was that we are and is that we we are looking at. I would like to look at every telomere in every cell, and you can do that, but it just costs. <laughs> but you can do it in a research setting, and, and it's very rewarding and informative things you find out. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm uh, myself as a as a young scientist so i've always been encouraged and i also asked myself to always think bigger and like think beyond this mutant think beyond my project um, but or i can see like in myself oh i am thinking bigger and bigger within science so i was wondering um is it possible like, for you to actually like, pinpoint or at what stage of your scientific career that you can actually uh, think bigger enough to like beyond the science and you yes, can see yes. the society? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, 
I think it's valuable to be doing what you're doing because you're deeply understanding something, and that's really where you can make impacts in properly understanding something. So keep looking at that mutant <laughs> and really thinking about it. But, you know, when I think about your question, I, I think there is a moment. And so I was doing lots of molecular and cell biology of telomeres, and we knew there were genes that are encoding the components of telomerase and the protective proteins of telomeres dedicated to those functions. And, uh, and I'd never thought about chronic stress. I thought that was just another world. And, and when Alyssa Apple said, well, can we look at telomeres? I said, sure, let's just do a feasibility study. And so that study actually was the one that gave those initial results. It was like, wow, there was something right there. Of course, we had to be very careful not to be fooled by it. And so it had to be replicated and done by others and expanded. But the point being that when we saw that relationship, it, it had an impact on me. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm a mother myself, and there was this group of people who were under this constant stress because their child was chronically ill and she didn't have much help. So in our society, we don't give much help. By the way, the Swedes, when I told them about this, they said, what are you talking about? In Sweden, you get a caregiver assigned to you by the state for every chronically ill child you have. You're not left on your own as a mother. You know, so we're talking about societal issues here. So these mothers, uh, and I'd you know, never been, fortunately, in the situation that these mothers were in, but... I really felt for them because, you know, parent myself, I could just see how awful it must have been for them. But what was very interesting was, and this was very telling, how they were responding. This was perceived stress. Some of them actually were very resilient. And so that was why it was so important to start learning what are the resiliency factors that helped them cope with what was objectively a long-term difficult situation, but there was a considerable variation among how people were able to cope. And that sort of led me into to your question, you know, which is, yeah, what do we do about these things? And how can we see if some intervention is being useful or not? And this is one objective measure. It's not the only one, but it's one way of saying, yeah, well, physiologically, things are changing with an intervention, and we know that in turn will lead to, if the telomeres are staying longer, will lead to having less risk of these diseases that we know are more risky if you have shorter telomeres. So it sort of got me thinking, wow, <laughs> you know, it did get me out looking out the window a bit. So that's Thank one, you. I think that was a moment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, uh, Help me thank Liz again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me.